I apologize in advance for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Although uh, some of you know, I, I served on I, I served on higher ed the last two years. I really enjoyed it, and I, I did enjoy the the last hour. Very interesting uh, conversation. But, Mr. Chair and members, I'm here to present to you AB 542, which would exempt early college high school and middle college high school students from caps on enrollment and apportionment funding that are placed for physical education courses provided by community colleges. Currently, community colleges waive student fees for every course but for PE. Move the bill. Second. AB 542 only addresses a small number of students in early college and middle high school students. My experience has been as a former community college trustee that uh, many of these students are first generation college students and so I view AB 542 is as a hand up, not a hand out. Can and I take I that? For an I vote. Take that as your close. Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> witnesses in support. Witnesses in opposition. No comments. We have a first by um, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Chavez. A second by Mr. Linder. Madam Secretary, if you'd call the roll. Medina. Aye. Medina. Aye. Baker. Bloom. Aye. Bloom. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chavez, aye. Harper. Irwin. Aye. Irwin, aye. Joan Sawyer. Aye. Joan Sawyer, aye. Levine. Aye. Levine, aye. Lender. Aye. Lender, aye. Lowe. Aye. Lowe, aye. Santiago. Aye. Santiago, aye. Weber. Aye. Weber, aye. Williams. 10-0. Mr. Wilk, your uh, bill goes out of committee. Thank you, Mr. It Chair. It passed to appropriations. I'll leave it open for members to add on. Appreciate it. Thank you. And next we'll move to it's item 12, 12 Mr. Lowe. Oh, what about Lowe? Number what, 11? What about 11? Uh, Levine. Okay. Okay. Lowe. Lowe. Lowe is He's already there. Okay. okay. Uh, go I'll, ahead, I'll Mr. get you Lowe. back. All right. Yeah. I know you will. <laughs> I know. I'll, I'll be ready. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, members, uh, for allowing me to present uh, AB uh, 716, which is the definition of supplanting. Uh, as many of you uh, may be aware of, this relates to special sessions, which are also known as extended courses, in which individuals um, can continue their uh, continuing education uh, by paying a fee. Uh, but the definition of supplanting uh, was not uh, specified, and so this simply clarifies the definition of supplanting, uh, which uh, basically um, focuses on the number of state-supported course offerings while increasing the number of self-supporting versions of that course. Um, the uh, auditor's office had uh, made an indication that uh, to clarify this information, uh, but because of the ambiguity of this information, anywhere from 26 to 914 courses uh, could be identified as supplanting. So this was essentially clarify that definition of supplanting. Uh, with me here today is Lillian Taze, a president of CF CFA, uh, and also Stephen Filing with the uh, Academic Senate. Good evening. My name is Lillian Taze. I'm a professor of history at Cal State LA and president of the California Faculty Association. AB 716 will add clarifying language to the education code to define the term supplanting and further describe how the CSU should measure whether supplanting is occurring. Our bill implements the recommendation of the California State Auditor to strengthen the definition of the term supplanting. That recommendation grew out of their report on the California State University's extended education program, which, among other things, found that while it appeared that supplanting had occurred without a clearer understanding of what the term supplanting meant, it would be difficult to, to uh, tell the extent of the problem. As a result, the auditor recommended the clarifying language be added to include a definition of the term supplant and a description of how CSU should measure whether supplanting is occurring. CFA worked with Assemblymember Gray and later with Assemblymember Williams last year on two pieces of legislation dealing with this very issue, but the bills were ultimately held in the Senate. We're back again this year work to work on a solution for this much needed clarification. By establishing a clear definition of supplanting, we can ensure that an appropriate number of cost-effective state-supported 
courses are available to the students who need them. Inadequate levels of funding coupled with growth in student enrollment leave students with difficult decisions for completing their degree. If they have the resources, they can pay for more expensive special session courses or wait until they can find a place in overcrowded state-supported courses. Neither of these options line up with the governor's stated goals of maintaining affordability and decreasing the amount of time it takes for a student to graduate. In fact, the effect is a two-tier system that is biased against the neediest of students. We recognize that special session extended education courses provide flexibility for students who can afford to take them, and we believe it is important to protect that option. However, without clear direction on what constitutes supplanting, we are unable to ensure that the CSU is providing those sections in addition to, and not in lieu of, more cost-effective state-supported courses. We ask for your support of AB 716. Good evening, sadly. My name is Stephen Felling. I'm the chair of the Academic Senate of California State University. We have a belief that the state has an obligation to the students of the CSU, an obligation to ensure that when they start a program of state-supported courses, they are entitled to finish that program by taking state-supported courses. The difference between state-supported and self-supported courses, I did some math while I was enjoying the dialogue this afternoon. For the course I teach, business ethics, which is required for business students, taking the course state-supported is about $550. Taking the course self-supported, 966 That difference is significant to a large number of our students. I talked to one of my students today who took a course over the winter term at the 966 rate. She's now taking one course less this spring because she's got to work three jobs rather than two to cover the cost of it. Pretty clearly that doesn't, as my colleague Lil noted, meet the governor's goals of affordability or access, and I'd argue that it doesn't do much for timely completion either. Self-support was in intended to provide flexibility. And in terms of flexibility, it should be an option rather than a necessity. AB 716 provides a workable structure that enables the state to ensure that that 966 versus 550 price point difference continues to be a choice rather than a mandate so that it doesn't delay our students' graduation because they can't afford the classes. We ask your support for AB 716. Any other witnesses in support? If, if you'd come up and state your name and what organization you're with. Hi, I'm uh, Mike, Mike Wanu, and I'm uh, a higher education researcher uh, with UCLA, and I support the bill. Hi, my name is Bernadette Bolaños. I'm a third year at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm also here with the California Faculty Association. Um, as a student, we support the bill. And I also just want to mention that although other students are here as well, we had many more students in the room that unfortunately had to leave because of the delay. But they, the students are behind the bill as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Husband. I am a student at Cal Poly Pomona, third year. I'm also here with the California Faculty Association, and I am in support of the bill. Hello, my name is Yvette Rivera, and I'm a third year student at uh, California State University, Chico, and I'm also in support of the bill. Good evening. My name is Cecil Canton. I'm a professor of criminal justice at Sac State. I'm also an associate vice president for affirmative action for the California Faculty Association, and I support the bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Egan. I'm a professor at California State University East Bay campus, and I urge you to support this bill after seeing the effects of supplanting on our campus and others. Kevin Weir, professor of sociology at Sacramento State. I'd like to thank the author and request the members of the committee to support the bill. Good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Eric Paredes. I am a graduating senior from Chico State, um, and I'm urging you all to please support this bill. Thank you, Assemblymember, for introducing this bill. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Becky Asami. I'm here with the California Faculty Association, and I'm a very recent graduate of Fresno State. Um, I'm here in support of the bill, um, and I urge you to support it as well. Witnesses in opposition. If you'd like to come up to the table. Not in opposition either. Oh. Uh, tweener. Okay. Nicole Munoz Murillo with the California State University. The bill is proposed and currently written is consistent with our executive order on the issue and is consistent also with our work with the state auditor. So we are neutral. Thank you. Any witnesses in opposition? Uh, comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Lowe, if you'd like to uh, close. I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Okay, so the motion before us is due pass to appropriations. Madam Secretary, if you'd call the roll. Medina. Aye. Medina, aye. Baker. Bloom. Chavez. Harper. Aye. Harper, aye. Irwin. Aye. Irwin, aye. Joan Sawyer. Aye. Joan Sawyer, aye. Levine. Aye. Levine, aye. Linder. Aye. Linder, aye. Lowe. Aye. Low I Santiago, Santiago I Weber, I. Weber I Williams, I. Williams I. The measure passes 10-0. We'll leave it open for members who want to add on. And next uh, item 11, Mr. Levine. No, I'm good with 11, unless you want to pass. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it. We could do it. All right, members, settle down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, AB 653 seeks to ensure that successful collaboration among California's institutions of higher education continues into the future uh, as, they, as new technologies are planned and implemented. This bill would require the CSU, UC, and community colleges to coordinate their efforts when investing in system-wide technology and prioritize that student success across segments is the number one priority. It is, it is important that we take full advantage of the benefits that technology has to offer. There is every reason for us to seek to maximize the benefits of technology as this can allow for higher quality 21st century services to be delivered by all of our higher education systems. Um, you know, we're looking for efficiencies here to maximize our resources, and I think something that's in this bill that I think in particular is special is the way to maximize the data that we are also collecting across our systems to better understand the need and demand for services and for classes by our students uh, that this bill will allow. I know that the segments are working toward these goals. This bill will ensure that work will continue, and I look forward to working with all of the segments as the bill moves forward to make sure that the provisions in the bill create goals that are achievable. Any witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Witness in opposition? Not in opposition. Uh, Jason Murphy on behalf of the University of California. In fact, we do not have a position as of today. However, we have been uh, in continued discussions with the author's office. Appreciate the interests he's had both this year in this bill and the year before, and look forward to continuing those, those fruitful discussions. Thank you. Any witnesses in opposition? Questions from the committee? I, I thank the author. I you know, want to see uh, the efficiencies, and, and I think that the more cooperation we can get from the segments uh, working together will, would, would move that forward. So we had a, a motion by Mr. Linder, second by Mr. Joan Sawyer. The motion is due pass to Appropriations Committee. Madam Secretary, you call the roll. Medina. Aye. Medina, aye. Baker. Aye. Baker, aye. Bloom. Chavez. Harper, aye. Harper I, Irwin, Joan Sawyer, aye. Joan Sawyer I, Levine, aye. Levine I, Linder, aye. Linder I, Lowe, aye. Lowe I, Santiago, aye. Santiago I, Weber, aye. Weber I, Williams, aye. Williams I. 10-0. 10-0, okay. it's Ten zero. It seems, Mr. Levine, that your measure has gotten out of committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll leave it open for members to add on. Uh, next uh, item uh, 19, uh, Mr. Williams. Mr. 
Chair, members, AB 968 establishes a standard notation across all higher ed segments for academic transcripts that will indicate on a student's transcript when the student is ineligible to re-enroll due to suspension or expulsion and the period of time the student is ineligible to re-enroll. This is, um, will only be in cases of violation of code of conduct, um, which includes campus sexual assault. Currently, there's no standard method for noting on an academic transcript when a student is suspended or expelled for violating a university's code of conduct. That means, members, that in so on some campuses, if you cheat on a test, it will go on your permanent record, but if you rape someone, it will not. That is unacceptable. And as a part of a, uh, a climate on the campuses that is simply unsafe. Uh, I'll give you some examples of the inconsistencies. Community colleges only make a notation on student transcripts for academic dismissal or academic disqualification. CSU makes a general notation on a transcript if the student is suspended or expelled for one academic year or more. And UC makes a general notation when a student is expelled. The inconsistency between the post-secondary education segments demonstrates the need to establish a standard that provides more clarity and more information for universities when they consider a transfer student for their campus. This bill creates this standard ensuring a, a safer and more secure campus environment for our students. Um, it is part of, of a, a package of, of two mil, bil, more bills you will see on campus sexual assault. Uh, I have uh, two folks with me um, uh, to testify. Um, one representative uh, from uh, the uh, CSU Students Association and one representative from Cal Casa. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, my name is Shana Brown and I represent the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Uh, we are the statewide professional association that serves all 84 rape crisis centers and prevention programs that serve all counties in California. And we have served as a national leader on campus violence via our work with the Office of Violence Against Women and the Centers for Disease Control. We are proud to support AB 968. Um, this is an important piece of legislation that will work to ensure that sta standards for consistency and for information sharing in order to address and prevent sexual violence on college campuses. This bill, AB 968, establishes a consistent notation for academic transcripts um, for the community colleges, CSU, and University of California systems. Um, ensuring that the various systems share information is crucial. Um, as we know, perpetrators will uh, move schools or will transfer, um, especially if uh, they are under investigation. Um, and we know that um, this is a very important piece um, or issue facing California and the nation. And we appreciate um, the assembly members' leadership on this topic. Um, and so I thank you for your consideration. Hi again, Miles Nevin with the California State Student Association. Because this bill requires a student's transcript to indicate a current suspension or history of expulsion, we see it as a common sense change that will allow institutions to fully understand a student's academic history in order to best serve them as well as the rest of the campus student body in social, emotional, physical, and academic ways. We're proud to support this bill. Andrew Martinez. Other witnesses in support? Andrew Martinez, California State University System in support of the bill as well. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Jason Murphy, again, on behalf of the University of California. We do not have a position at this time. However, we do believe we're substantially uh, in compliance with the bill as it reads today. We hope to be in support very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin Selnick from the Chancellor's Office, California Community Colleges. And we don't have a f an official position on the bill yet, but we believe it's a very important issue. And we look forward to working with the author as the bill continues. Thank you. Witnesses in opposition. Uh, questions or comments from uh, the committee? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Williams, thank you. I'm looking forward to supporting your bill. Uh, I just uh, am looking for a point of clarification. You mentioned that the um, notation is limited to expulsions or suspensions related to a violation in code of conduct. 
And um, I'm not sure if that's language. I don't see the language in the bill. I just wondered, just as a point of clarification, is that the intent of the bill, or is there um, a focus on, on making that specific change, or if you deem it appropriate and your goals? I'm not sure that it is, well, but you mentioned it. So Sure. The, the internal process that a campus has mm -hmm. is only for violations of the code of conduct. Okay. So by... By definition, that's what what it, what it would be. Um, the the things that are outside the code of conduct is not the purview of those campus procedures. So remember, in these cases, there is a criminal justice, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, procedure, um, which unfortunately almost never has any accountability for rapists in this society. Mm -hmm. uh, the accountability in all spheres is less than. 1% of cases. Um, and then there is the arena of uh, the code of conduct procedures, procedures on a campus. And those, because they have a different burden of proof, have a more likely chance of providing accountability for sexual assault. OK, just and, so, oh, I'm, I apologize. No, no problem. Uh, just um, so the, I would, if I'm just clear on this, that it, because a suspension or expulsion only comes from a code of conduct violation, that's why it's not necessary to put the specific language into right. the bill? I mean, if, if that was uh, desirous of the committee or even of yourself, mm -hmm. we'd be happy to clarify that. Understood. And um, also for additional witness, the, you mentioned there would be a consistent notation on the transcript. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, I guess what I want to make sure is that we don't have something that allows someone to get around it with any other notation on there. And we want this to be clear as a bell why you were suspended and that it is for the violation of code of conduct and, and make sure that it does cover uh, sexual violence. Uh, I just, again, I might be, leave it to the lawyer in me, but I'm just making sure that there's a way that is a consistent notation because that as well is not in the bill. Um, I don't know that it's necessary. It might be my need to educate myself on suspensions and expulsion process and what it notation would be, but can you comment on where, where that would be? or Sure. That would be? I, I, I can only say that we are close, working closely with the segments, um, not only to make sure that this is standard, uh, but uh, in getting to, the, to issues that have arisen when there are campuses that are already doing this, um, uh, which you know, includes such cases as people trying to take that to court to remove that from a transcript. Mm -hmm. um, so there are still some outstanding issues to, to deal with like that, uh, but, uh, but, but we intend to do so. I, I think it's, it's a, a change of, um, it's a, a, a change of culture on these campuses. Uh, these campuses have in the past, I think, relied too often on a criminal justice procedure that, um, number one, rarely has an arrest, number two, uh, only in 5% of cases has a victim coming forward. And uh, number three, even when such things happen, DAs rarely prosecute. Well, I think it's an excellent bill. I'm very happy to support it. It will take you at your uh, good word that um, this, it, the code of contact point is exactly as it is. And if, if you feel that it covers that, um, I, I defer to that. But I just would make sure before it hits and hopefully gets signed into law that it does actually cover that. And if, if, if uh, you're desirous of belt and suspenders and calling that out specifically, I will do so. Mr. Williams, would you like to close? Uh, well, just uh, appreciate the support of the committee uh, uh, on this issue. Uh, and uh, of course, um, appreciate your patience in listening to me um, uh, at this late hour. Thank you so much, members. Did I have a motion? I had a motion by Mr. Linder, second by Mr. Levine. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Williams for your leadership on, on this matter, on this subject. Uh, thank you very much for the hearing that, you, uh, that we conducted together at UCLA. And I'm very happy to support this bill and to continue to work with you as we continue to make sure that our campuses uh, address this very serious issue. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the motion is due pass to appropriations. Madam Secretary, if you could call the roll. Medina. Aye. Medina, aye. Baker. Aye. Baker, aye. Bloom. Chavez. Harper. Aye. Harper, aye. Irwin. Aye. Irwin, aye. Jones-Sawyer. 
Joan Sawyer, I. Levine. Levine, I. Linder. Linder, I. Lowe. I. Lowe, I. Santiago. Santiago, I. Weber. I. Weber, I. Williams. I. Williams, I. 11 0, your uh, bill comes out of committee. It will keep it open uh, for members to add on. And, and at, that, at this point, if we could, please. Um, we need to. Oh, okay. I will have, uh, if I could have a motion and a second for the consent calendar. A uh, motion by uh, Mr. Santiago, second by Mr. Levine. Madam Secretary, if you'd call the roll. Medina? Aye. Medina, I. Baker? Aye. Baker, I. Bloom? Chavez? Harper? Aye. Harper, I. Irwin? Aye. Irwin, I. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer, I. Levine? Aye. Levine, I. Linder? Aye. Linder, I. Lowe? Aye. Lowe, I. Santiago? Aye. Santiago, I. Weber? Aye. Weber, I. Williams? Aye. Williams, I. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're happy to hear your bills. And notice that I'm going after uh, Mr. Levine. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I, I want to uh, Thank the, the committee, and uh, I've uh, adopted uh, the amendments as outlined on page three of the analysis. Uh, California public and nonprofit university students fare better than most when it comes to student loan debt. But still in 2013, 55% of those graduating seniors had student loans that averaged over $20,000. Data shows that nearly 50% of the students borrowing private loans, loans that contain less favorable provisions for borrowers, are leaving federal loan monies on the table. AB 721 is an important bill that provides students with the necessary information to make informed decisions about college attendance costs and student lending options. For these reasons, I respectfully ask for your I vote. Move the bill. Second. Uh, um, my name is Debbie Cochran. I'm with the Institute for College Access and Success, also known as TCAS, um, also known as the Project on Student Debt. We do um, a variety of research on college affordability issues and student debt-related issues for California and the country. Um, if folks have heard about the numbers um, that Mr. Medina just shared, you know, of, of the average college debt of graduates being around $20,000, California being a low debt state, those are based on our numbers on an analysis that we do every year. This year will be the 10th year. Um, and those numbers are based on voluntarily reported data from public and nonprofit colleges. Um, because it's voluntarily reported, we only have about 89% of public and nonprofit college graduates covered in that data. So that, those figures that you're hearing about when we hear California is a low debt state, they're incomplete um, because some colleges are choosing not to report. Also, w only one for-profit college in the state of California, the Academy of Art, chose to report those data. Um, so this bill would provide better coverage for those data. Also, you know, many, uh, many students who don't get enough money from state or federal aid have to turn to private loans. But experts agree private loans should only be used as a last resort. So it's incredibly troubling that 47% of private loan borrowers are not exhausting their federal student loan options. And there's no requirement of colleges to make students aware that federal loans are available to them or that they might have untapped federal loan eligibility. So this bill would help with that. Um, Finally, one reason that some students are taking out private loans is because their college doesn't offer federal loans. Um, in California, there are 22 California community colleges that have chosen to pull out of the federal loan program. So if they find themselves in a pinch and need to borrow money, they have to turn to a private loan. Um, but students might not even be aware before they need that loan that uh, only private loan options are available to them. So on each of these fronts, this bill would give students the information they need uh, to, make in to make informed decisions about where to go to college and how to finance it. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support? 
or members of the public in support? Hi, Linda Liu with Young Invincibles in support. Other support? Any comments in opposition? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Scott Governor here on behalf of University of Phoenix. First, we bristle at the suggestion that our institutions don't provide data. In fact, private for-profit schools are required to provide data today under federal law. I have a sheet right, right here. I have a bunch of copies if anyone would like. We show the average debt for, or the median debt for federal loan, private loans, institutional financing. We also show the cost for tuition and books and other fees. This is required today under federal law. Those requirements increase in July of this year. Under this bill, what we have to do, we have to give students a sheet with the federal information and then a similar but different sheet with state information. This is going to be confusing at best to students. They're going to have numbers which should be the same, but they are not. Part of the reason they are not the same is that the bill only applies to first-time students. At University of Phoenix, about 15% of our student population qualifies as first-time. So what this bill requires is that we have to provide average student debt for 15% of our student population and report that as the average student debt as if it was our entire population. We don't think that's accurate or reasonable to our students. Um, so this information is done today, and that's a problem. We don't think it's beneficial to do it this way. We've asked the author that he consider providing that if you are covered by the federal game for employment rules, you'd be exempt from the provisions of the bill because you are already providing it. And in fact, those requirements increase exponentially in July of this year when the feds are making our sector report even more data. You know, we'd like this to be changed. We think our students do get more information than those at traditional schools. And if TCAS would like information on student debt, all they have to look is at the Federal Gainful Employment site. It's all there. It has been there, will continue to be there. So for these reasons, we must oppose, unless, uh, oppose the bill unless amended. Thank you. Additional comments from the public in opposition? Questions from committee members? I, I know this is the last hearing and we really want to get through, but I did have a quick question. I, the, um, the issue with private loans, and I, I mean, I think this is great disclosure. It, this, is, this is a really important bill, but how do you get the information about students' private loans? Do they have to disclose them themselves, or you're talking here about certification. Do they have to, if a private loan is issued, does it have to go through the school? Because I, I do know when I was going to school, there were people that, got loans at 20 and 30 percent, and I doubt that the, the, uh, the institution knew anything about them. There, there have been, uh, depending on the market conditions, there have sometimes been direct-to-consumer loans for private education loans. Generally, schools are aware of the, of the private loans that students are now taking out. They have to be self-certified, so a student will, um, will kind of mark down, you know, information about what their college costs are, kind of the college can sign off on it. Sometimes it might happen where the school is not aware of the private loan, but I think when the school is aware, they should have an obligation to let the student know that federal loans are still available. Okay. But, but in general, um, the institutions have access to yes. that type of information nowadays? In general, the information flows through the schools. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Linder. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, my question is just in regards to the, the argument that the University of Phoenix brought forward that the information is indeed uh, duplicative and there may be somewhat, I mean, it seems to me it would be a, a, a reasonable solution to um, find the data that's already being provided by the, the federal government mandates. Is that something that, that's possible? It, it, my my understanding is that uh, UC and, and uh, CSU does it a different way. Uh, different from uh, the uh, for-profit private and uh, and so to to ask to do it you know the different way would be to ask CSU and UC to do it differently uh, I see that there might be a misunderstanding you uh, mind if no, this, well, ask this our question. amendment isn't suggesting that they do it the way the federal government mandates our amendment is saying they can continue to do it under this methodology, but for those schools that do it under gainful employment, they shall provide that data. We're not asking them to do anything different. We're simply saying we do it 
what the Fed, the Obama administration has made clear rules for our institutions. We do it that way. They can do it that voluntary way. We're not asking them to change anything. Also, also, uh, I also believe that another difference is that you, you are collecting uh, data on on the the median. That's correct. Uh, loan debt, and we are asking for the average as, as a number uh, that would be more representative. If I may, the, the federal government, when they did their rulemaking on debt, kind of looked at average versus median, and they believed that the median number was more appropriate. Plus, please remember this, and I provided the rulemaking to, to, to Ms. Mattoon. The, um, remember, in this instance, we're only talking about 15 percent of our student population. That's not, a, you know, that's statistically inaccurate. It's not a proper number to use. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think one of the issues is that no definition is perfect. The federal gainful employment definition is not perfect. The definition in this bill is not perfect. There are drawbacks, um, but there's real value to having a consistent definition across types of institutions. That's what makes for apples to apples comparisons. That's what's useful for consumers. Um, consumers can't compare an average from one, calculated in one way with an, a median calculated in a different way. So the real value is having one definition that all schools use um, and so that and consumers can be informed. Further question from members? I'm going to support the bill because I think it's an important issue and I think it's early in the process. But I do think that you should uh, think about use of the mean versus the median. I think you could ask a bunch of statisticians and they're going to tell you a median is a far more accurate number than a mean because a mean is distorted by outliers um, at the higher end or lower end. Um, we use median income not mean income as a measure. We, uh, and and I, get, I think the other part is that if, if California institutions use the mean and the ones outside of state use median, um, it could potentially inaccurately compare those for people who are choosing between an in or out state. I think it's such an important issue that I want this bill to move forward, and I'm going to support it, but I just ask you to think about those uh, two, two questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Williams. I, I actually, you know, as a statistician, I would love to see both median and mean for all of these schools. Um, understand that that's not really doable. Just to, to clarify, um, because I don't think we said it earlier, um, the data that we use for our report is not it's not our definition. Um, it's a definition based on a common data set. It's a it's a voluntary survey that four year colleges complete. Um, the, there's a panel of folks that come up with what the questions are and what schools should have to answer. Um, so you know. We might even agree on that median is better on some counts, but it's it's not really up to us. And this is the survey that schools that want to be included in college publisher guides, um, you know, if you want to be included in U.S. News World World Report college guides, um, this is what you complete so that you're included in those rankings. Um, I, so I. It's probably uh, unlikely that we will really shift that to a median. Um, the other value of a mean is that we get to aggregate it, right? If we just had medians for each college, we wouldn't be able to say, for instance, the average debt in California is this versus this in Nevada. That's helpful. Thank you. Seeing no further question from members, uh, Mr. Chairman, would you like to close? I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, the motion is a due pass, and clerk will call the roll. Medina? Aye. Medina, aye. Baker? Aye. Baker, aye. Bloom? Aye. Bloom, aye. Chavez? Harper? Aye. Harper, aye. Irwin? Aye. Irwin, aye. Joan Sawyer? Aye. Joan Sawyer, aye. Levine? Aye. Levine, aye. Linder? Aye. Linder, aye. Lowe? Aye. Lowe, aye. Santiago? Aye. Santiago, aye. Weber? Aye. Weber, aye. Williams? Aye. Williams, aye. Mr. Chairman, 12-0, out of committee. Uh, uh, those on consent. Uh, we have one, one bill to call. 
I don't mind redoing it for kids. Who's still alive? It's like a sense. We can set it back. We put it on it. Okay, thank God. Okay. Yeah, when do you so we're going to lift the call? Yeah, on AB 206. All right, we are going to uh, lift the call on AB 206. Okay. Chavez? Levine? Levine, I. Linder? Okay. Linder not voting. Low? Low, I. Santiago? Santiago, I. Williams. I. Williams, I. Nine, two. The bill passes, nine, two. Okay. So you can do add-ons for everything else. Okay, we're doing add-ons. We'll just do them in file order. Report each one out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. AB 38. Low. Aye. Low, I. That's 12 1. AB 38 uh, is out of committee. 12 1. AB 176. Low. Aye. Low, I. AB 176, out of committee, 12 1. AB 288, Baker? Aye. Baker, I. Chavez? Low? Aye. Low, I. Santiago? Aye. Santiago, I. Williams? Aye. Williams, I. Aye. 12 0. AB 288, out of committee, 12 0. AB 393, Chavez, Levine, I. Levine, I, Low, I. Low, I, Santiago, I. Santiago, I. AB 393, out of committee, 12 0. AB 404, Chavez, Irwin, I. Irwin, I, Levine, Levine I low I. low I Santiago Santiago I. AB three hundred four out of committee twelve zero. AB four two one Chavez. Okay, it's still twelve zero. AB four twenty one out of committee twelve zero. AB four five eight Baker. Baker I, Chavez, Low, I. Low I, Santiago, I. Santiago I, Williams, I. Williams I. AB 458, out of committee, 11 1. AB 542, Baker, I. Baker I, Harper, I. Harper I, Williams, I. Williams I. AB 542, out of committee, 13-0. AB 653, Bloom. Aye. Bloom, I. Chavez, Irwin. Aye. Irwin, I. AB 653, out of committee, 12-0. AB 716, Baker. Aye. Baker, I. Bloom. Bloom I. Chavez. AB 716, out of committee, 12 0. AB 721, Chavez. 13, 12 0. AB 721, out of committee, 12 0. AB 831, Chavez. Levine. Levine, I. AB 831, out of committee, 12 0. AB 837, Williams. 
William's eye. AB 837, out of committee, 10-3. AB 889, Chavez. Still 12 AB 889, out of committee, 12-0. AB 968, Bloom. Aye. Bloom, I. Chavez. AB 968, out of committee, 12-0. And the consent calendar. Uh, Bloom. Aye. Bloom, I. Chavez. Consent calendar passes 12 0. Is it possible to hold those open just briefly longer for Mr. Chavez? I understand you may be heading this way. Will that be a problem? It's fine. fine. He's coming back. Okay. We'll leave it open for <laughs> five. <laughs> five minutes? Sure. Five. Five minutes. Thank you for the courtesy.